Welcome to today's episode of Rainer on Leadership, your online home for leadership lessons and advice for the local church. I'm Tom Rainer. I'm joined with Sam Rainer, and we are going to be talking about safeguards to make sure your church's finances stand up under scrutiny. Now, I got to say this before we go any further. I got to say this. If you want to look at your church finances and look at maybe what you can do to be a better steward, to see funds come in at a at a very generous rate, if you want to see how to raise money for your budget or for a capital project, I just got to mention this, Sam, and then we'll get on to the show. It's kind of spontaneous on my part. I love church growth services. Yeah, I, I do as well. Uh, they will help you with your church finances, as my dad says, or they will help you with your church what's finances. A fin- what's a finance? If you want to say the word. It's like finesse? It, it's it's the – yeah, I'm I'm sure some of our listeners will agree, will agree Look, with you. You're, you're Maybe the some guy. will agree with me. And we've just started this great – we've started you, you, this great debate. <laughs> yeah. Church growth services. They can help you with all things money related you, at the church. How about that? <laughs> and 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 they'll help you with things of church finance as well. Yes. Or finance. Church or, finance. Or, or you can go finance. buy a Coke, yes. a soda, or as you say, pop. Yeah. Pop. Pop. Well, so, yeah, soda soda here in Florida, it's pop in Indiana. And I'm sure some Hoosiers will tell me that they say different things, but you know, whatever. I, I grew up all over that except out west. So I have all I'm, I have a mishmash of. Well, we're going to talk about keeping those safeguards to make sure your church's finances show up. Stand up under, under scrutiny. <laughs> we struggle struggle to say that. Yeah, we're going. To work you know, on money. It, hey, before we do that, I want to thank Southeastern Seminary. Southeastern Seminary Sam has been our sponsor for quite a while. Uh, they're I love their commitment to the Word of God. I love their commitment to the fact that they train men and women for ministry. Yeah, their theological education, but they're a lot more than that. I love the fact that we have a partnership with them in the uh, MA in church revitalization. So much about it. And yeah, you can go on campus in Wake Forest or you can uh, go online. There's just lots of ways to uh, connect with Southeastern. But um, just just to let you know that if you do apply there, you can uh, look in the place uh, for, the, for the application and where there's a place for a, a code. You can just put church answers, one word, no space, one word, and they will waive your application fee. We love our folks at Southeastern. Thank them for being a longtime sponsor. Appreciate our friends at Southeastern, such as Danny Aiken, the president, and uh, Chuck Lawless, uh, one of the deans at Southeastern as well. So wanted to give a good word for, for them, Sam. Talk to us about these four keeps, key safeguards to make sure your church's money stands up under scrutiny. Yeah, money is one of the most sensitive issues in the church. I mean, this is top of the list. If it's not number one, then it's, I don't know, top three, top five. But it's also one of the most visible issues in the church. And churches can struggle with the right amount of financial oversight. So we're going to talk about how you can put some safeguards in place to have the proper amount of of oversight. Um, So let's just begin by this. There's three areas that are often missed before we get to the four safeguards. Um, Three three areas that are often uh, missed. Um, Major spending outside of the budget, using part of the budget for unintended purposes, and hiding personal expenses. And that that last one sounds very nefarious, but people they they do it by accident. So I don't I don't mean to imply poor motives with with any of these things. So let, major spending outside of the budget. Dad, um I knew of a church that uh wanted to feed the entire community at Thanksgiving. Um which sounds very noble. That helps uh, small, small town, town and they sp- yeah, 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 exactly. Um, the one of the pastors at the church spent close to seventy thousand well, dollars buying food, and did not budget well for that event. Problem? I would is say that, that, that it's a problem that may result in his termination. But <laughs> he should have been terminated. He should have been terminated on the spot. 
But the church was gracious. Um, the lead pastor was gracious and decided that uh, let's not do that because the motive was pure, the heart was pure. But you can't do that now. You may say, "I would never." My church, my whole church budget is seventy thousand um, dollars. But the principle applies. Don't do major do you- spending outside of the budget. And then this gets to the second point, which is using part of the budget yeah, for well, unintended purposes. Yeah, well, an example would be you have a personnel line on there and uh, uh, maybe a t- different areas of personnel. You have salaries, you have benefits, and all of a sudden uh, you, you, you have this big major musical production and all the costs alongside of that are going to be $10,000. And you, you kind of justify it. Well, you know, it's kind of like personnel expenses. And so you pay that amount, but it's not within the personnel category. Yeah. And that's a good example, but I've, a few churches I think are finding ways to put more money in, to, to, to raise the personnel budget. Usually they're hiding, usually they, they take personnel yeah. out and put it in other places. Um, and, and that's not wise either. Uh, I, you know, I've just, I've seen this happen in many cases. You, you want to spend money on something and we'll take it, we'll take it a little from over here, a little from over there, a little from over there. And that way the budget looks even. Well, th- that's a poor practice because now you don't understand your own budget. If you're just pulling from everywhere, what's the point of a budget? There is no point. And if you're going to go over on budget, then go over whatever line item it is and just recognize that you went over so that you, you know, know what a budget is a budget the following year. Mm-hmm. It's a budget. It's a guideline. You are never. Yeah. You're never going yeah. to go. And I think some perfectly tr- on every line item. You're going to go over on some. You're going to go under on some. You try to get the total balanced, but uh, don't hide these items so that you're trying to get the line items balanced. That's what you're saying there. Right. Right. And the last thing is something that I think happens a lot, and people just don't know they're doing it. And that's hiding personal expenses in the budget. So there's things like if you, let's say you have a budget for meals and you take out guests, let's say you're a lead pastor, you take out guests, your church has graciously given you a small budget to, to do that. And then you pay for your own family while you're out to eat. You can't do that. You know, that that's not proper accounting. You, you need to s- separate those checks. You need to pay for your own family outside of, um, yep. Yep. And outside and many times it's innocent. Hey, I've got one credit card. Uh, we're taking out people and uh, it's me and these people, which would be part of the justified expense. But I've got three or four family members with me and you just don't think twice about it. It's not nefarious in motive all the time, but it is wrong in practice. Right. Yeah, it's actually right. against best practices in accounting. Um, so let's talk about let's talk, talk. Those are some of the problems, and there's plenty of other. So these these problems I bring up only because they are typically done with good motives. There's plenty of other budget problems that we could bring up where people really go into it trying to embezzle or you know bad motives, all that. I'm just assuming the best of people in this episode. So there are things that happen that aren't exactly right that people do with good motives. So how can how can we have safeguards to where you're not compromising your ministry with something that you meant well with? Um, so safeguard number one is to have a consistent process for counting the weekly offering, for inputting data, for bookkeeping, for preparing financial records. There's different ways to do it. You just need to make sure that you're doing it consistently. Follow your well, own and, and rules. And also on the counting the offering, that is where the trouble can sometimes occur pretty quickly. And that's why that's why you need accountability in counting the offering. That's why you need it two to three people uh, to safeguard the counting of the offering. Particularly, th- there was a day, Sam, that there was a lot of cash in the offering plate. And not, yeah. yeah, not anymore. I mean, it, it most churches, uh, very little cash is put in the offering plate, but there is still some and in many churches, it can amount to hundreds of dollars, if not, if you're a larger church, thousands of dollars at times. Um, so you do need to make sure that there is always two people, at least two people associated with a particular part of the process. Never have just one person. It, if, there's a, if there's a link between processes and your financial accountability hey, system, by, always by the way, I, I was talking to and, one of our uh, church answer clients not too long ago 
And uh, they had an anonymous gift of $2,000, all in 20s, put in an envelope in the offering plate. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that. Fat I've envelope. seen that happen. And, you know, that that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Fat. It just had to be a real fat What's envelope. That? <laughs> it probably was. A, yes, if it was all 20s, yes, there was probably some heft. Yeah, I don't know if it's a traditional gift. offering envelope. Um, that wouldn't have fit. That just had to be an envelope. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, my mind is just trying to uh, – $2,000 in, in 20s, my mind is going to how thick that would be. So never mind. Uh, you you could get that precisely because I'm sure there's somebody out there who has you know done the measurements on a, the the width thickness, of the, thickness, I'm sure it's measured know. what microns or something I don't thickness I'm thickness, sorry there we go there we go get yeah, back the, to your topic the, Sam not, I was listening to you yeah I'm just saying make sure that it's never one person in any one part of the process always always at least two people um, in particular I would say I'm with you on the cash and the offering plate and that's a weak that's a potential weak point for a lot of churches, but I would also say inputting data is where most churches end up, you know, th they just give it to the bookkeeper and we'll just let them handle it. And data can be, if you use QuickBooks, I mean, it's a great system and we use QuickBooks here at Church Answers, but it can be, the data yes, can be can manipulated. Be. And you, you just got to be very careful um, and make sure that you have multiple people involved at all points of the process. So that's that's safeguard one, not only having multiple people, but also having a consistent process. Don't always be changing it up. Don't always be doing one-offs. You just got to stick stick to stick to the process. I actually have um, a, a means of accountability. I never Oh, yeah. If they come up to you and say, well, you put this in the plate or the ever. box, you say no. I, I, I always say no. Um, and I explain why I just say for the sake of accountability as the lead pastor, I, I don't have this level of access to the finances. And they always go, oh, that's wonderful. I mean, the response is always positive. Just say, you know, as a lead pastor, I, I am not able to do this. Let me point you to one of our deacons. And a lot of our deacons handle the offering. So let me point you to one of our deacons. Or we have these giving boxes all over campus. And I show them where the giving boxes are. And they're locked. And, you know, they're safe and all of that. And they go, oh, okay, I've, I've, I've seen those. I didn't know what those were. Um, even though there's yeah. a big give now sign on it. Um, and we we have that in place. I would encourage if you are in key leadership in the church on staff where you're getting a paycheck from the church, there you have no business taking funds from people. Have other people in the church who do that. So I always direct people um, to either a giving box or a deacon. And, and they've and always been glad to do it. We've alluded totally to understand. number two, safeguard number two, multiple checkpoints, multiple people involved. The I, I was about to say the more people you have involved, the better. Of course, you can't get too many. I understand that. But multiple people, it's always better than one person in all of these cases. Yeah, and, and multiple checkpoints. So we one of the things that we do at West Bradenton is we have – a system of double checking at every major point. So we have a treasurer who has complete access to our books and he double checks our bookkeeper and our bookkeeper. She's amazing. She does an incredible job and is, has some of the highest accountability and integrity of anybody I know. Uh, so she welcomes that. So our treasurer double checks our bookkeeper. We have a stewardship committee and the chair double checks the financial statements that are produced. Um, and I, as the lead pastor, don't have access to any of that. Um, and that's wise. I think that's wise. And understand there's different perspectives on this and different levels of involvement when it comes to lead or executive pastor. I would just say that the accountability is better when you have multiple checks. It's always better. It is, it is always better, whether it is the taking of the offering, the counting of the offering, the input of the records. The creation of the financial statements, it's always better to have multiple people. Every time that we have seen some type of financial problem in a church, and I'm thinking more of illegal ones at this point, it's, it's not always illegal, but every time I'm, it's always been a breakdown in the accountability. Something happened where the church did not have good accountability. So it's a good safeguard. How, how, how about this number three? When you say transparent and consistent reporting, what is transparent reporting? 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, there's different philosophies here as well. And you, you can be transparent in different ways. But uh, one of the things that we tell our people at West Bradenton is any debit and credit is available for you to review. A church member, upon request, can see anything that they want to see when it comes to the books. And we actually, we actually had somebody who took us up on that at one point, and he was a forensic accountant uh, in the fraud in, in the fraud world. So he goes, "I want to see some stuff." So we let him into the books, of course, under supervision, under supervision, and uh, squeaky clean. He came out and said, "Yeah, there's, I don't see any issues here." So we felt we felt pretty good about that. That's a bit of an anomaly yeah. and a bit unusual. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, but I <laughs> okay. I found it humorous. <laughs> We'll we'll talk motives later. We'll talk motives off offline. Um, but I, I do believe that you need to be consistent in your reporting. So you, you need to have a, a a normal way of showing your financials, whatever that is. Um, and I realize some churches show more detail. Show so, some some churches show less detail. I'm not necessarily saying you need to have these super detailed financial statements, but it needs to be consistent. And people need to understand: we cash positive or we cash poor. You know where where do we stand? Um, and a basic, I think a basic P and L or an income statement should how be required. Often, how often does your any church size. produce those statements um, monthly? Quarterly. A quarterly. We we produce quarterly statements for anybody to review. We put them quarterly out statements. in our commons area. We. Yeah, yeah. I mean, quarter monthly's a bit much in my mind, but it's not crazy. Um, if you want to do that, I mean, any one month can show any number of things, but four times a year, uh, we're putting out our financial statements. So there's a consistent, the, everyone knows they're coming. They're coming in the same way that they always do. And they very clearly and understandably show the numbers. I'm really not a big fan of churches that put out, you know, these colorful, bro. Uh, okay. The colorful brochures are great. They're great marketing. That doesn't need to be your financial statement where you you just have a few numbers smattered in a seven page you know update Th that's a good update for your people but you also need to produce some financial statements for for people to see and I think it'll keep you out of a whole lot of trouble if if you just put stuff out there regularly you may have 10 percent of your congregation 20 percent of your congregation that reads it but at least but that's 10 percent of 20 percent of your congregation knows they can. that's that's, that's, that's the asking big hundred percent. Yes, a hundred percent of the congregation right. knows that it is available. Right, this fourth time. safeguard, you have spoken to it already in this. Maintain strong leadership accountability. Do not make any exceptions. All right, I've heard a few examples. One example is don't let anybody hand you any of the funds. Make sure you stay away from those. Uh, don't get involved in the finances. You get the reports just like any other member would. Uh, I would assume. What are some other examples of strong leadership accountability? Um, we actually require all of our pastors and ministers on staff to tie. Oh, that's get some cards and, and letters. I mean. You can be disciplined. I don't care. Let me tell you, if you are getting a paycheck from the church, part-time, full-time, whatever, and you're not tithing on that paycheck, okay. shame on you. I, I, how you do you don't feel about deserve it, to be in ministry. I, feel I, I want our audience to know that Sam has and the gift you, of visceral. So, he, yeah, I do. I do. I I feel very strongly about that. And I understand. Okay, understand. People have theological differences about the tithe. I get that. But the principle is: if you're not willing to give back to God from what you're getting from God's church. You don't deserve to lead God's church. And I believe that it is, if you have not tithed or given sacrificially, whatever phrase you want to put there, whatever your theology is, if you're not giving sacrificially from, from what you're getting from the church, you, know you should be terminated. Just, I, I, you are disqualified I'm, I'm from I'm trying ministry. to get a little bit of clarity. I don't really know how you feel about it. Yeah. You've got me riled up now, <laughs> and you're trying to rile me up even more for the sake of the show. It's what you're doing. Well, I, I, okay. What, what else? Strong leadership accountability. We've talked about giving proportionately if, if you're if you're getting a paycheck, and you said the tithe, but again, we'll get we'll not get into the theological debate there. I've always thought the tithe was way too low, so I don't even like it as a as a bottom mark as a as a bottom yeah, marker. Exactly. But, but, exactly. But, but anyway, yes. any other accountability? Uh, any any other? thing that we should to say, never make an exception to this. 
Um, so we do credit checks sure. on potential pastors as well. Um, so part of employment is a credit check, um, just to see if there's any major warning signals there. And we also require a giving check on anybody that's going to be put in. You don't do that giving check. Church, I want to make that clear on that. I do not do the giving check. So we have a nominating committee who selects people for other committees. Um, and we have the nominating committee vet those who could potentially serve Particularly in other positions. parts of the church uh, before in in leadership before we before we put them in leadership before we even ask them to be in leadership because that's a really awkward conversation how will you serve and then you have to come nah. back and say yeah you're not giving you can't serve um so so we vet people before we even ask on as and our nominating committee does that so the only people that serve in leadership at our church are those who are I, let me tell you why I like this. It's a story you've probably heard so many times that you're saying, here he goes again. But I'm going to say it. Maybe some listeners and viewers have not heard the story. I was at a church where the person who had the most financial power, it was called head of our stewardship committee, I believe. It was finance committee. But it was, it was the most powerful person related to finances in the church, a layperson. And I'd been a pastor for about a year and a half. And the financial secretary came to me and said, I know I'm not supposed to tell you this. And I said, well, don't tell me. And she said, well, I've got to. And she said, such and such has never given to our church. And she said, it bothers me. That should never happen. All right. She and did the I'm right thing. Tell that story. Too. So once I've been <laughs> able to speak. So I said, that should have never happened. You did the right thing. So I, I, so I told her that. <laughs> so I told her that. Did I put and words in your mouth? I had the responsibility of then going to other key leaders and saying, we've got to do something here. It ended up being one of those situations where there was such opposition to me from his group, if you will, that I, I didn't know if I was going to keep my job or not. Because basically I said, you can't do this. Or someone else told him you can't do this anymore. But he knew that I was... Uh, that I was in on that the, on that issue. If there had been a check on this at the beginning, I would have never been put in that position. He had never given to the church, and he was making major yeah. recommendations about the church's funds. Yeah, I mean, we do doctrine check, we do um, faithfulness check in terms of attendance, and we do a check on uh, giving before people serve in leadership. And I think that that's why These are just about any four great safeguards, Sam. And I, I really hope that church members hear and watch this. I hope that members of finance committees here help staff members watch and hear this because every church needs to have these four safeguards in, in place. But I will let you talk about our good friends at Tyndale as we close this out. You know, there's some of my favorite people. Oh. Now, you know, we've through this partnership that we have with them, I've they've just become some of my favorite people, and they also produce some of my yes. favorite resources, including including the Inspire Bible Collection. Inspire is the best selling Bible line for coloring and creative journaling. So, um, I like Inspire as gifts. So, I've got some artists in my family. Um, my daughter. This would be a great the, gift the, for my daughter. The person who birthed you. Um, she's and and my wife. I want to be your well. mother. Sam. They, neither of them listen your... to this podcast. Yes. Oh, my mother. Okay, yes. Sorry, I'm I'm looking at the copy over here, kind of halfway paying attention to what you're saying as you're in. Is your well, as you're interrupting me? Um, but but it does it does run in the family. Uh, my my mom likes artwork, yes, and my daughter likes to do this. So it'd be, it'd be good for them. Uh, so this includes a variety, Inspire includes a variety of single column New Living Translation Bibles and portions of books featuring hundreds of beautiful line art illustrations for coloring and wide margins for Bible journaling. Uh, so you can you can check more out at inspirebible.com. Um, it's a great gift for those who do a lot of creative journaling um, and... I would just say they make great gifts. So inspirebible.com, uh, Tyndale produces them. They're in the New Living Translation, and I, I think and they're, I I think they're wonderful. And you know who else I think is wonderful, Dad? I think my mom is wonderful. Okay. So thank you for pointing that out. I and I think our listeners, I love the listeners wonderful. here. I think our and listeners viewers. are wonderful. And thank, thank, thank you, listeners and viewers, all of you YouTube people. How you doing? Um, 
Uh, they, they just saw me nod, but those who are listening can hear me. So thanks again for joining us today on Rainer on Leadership. Be sure to watch on YouTube, subscribe on iTunes, subscribe on Google Podcasts. That's where I listen to podcasts. Spotify, wherever it is, we want you to hear what we have to say. And we're glad that you listen. So thank you. You can also check us out at churchanswers.com, where we are growing healthy churches together. <laughs>